life. Three little atoms, two hydrogen, one oxygen, make all the difference for human survival in a physical sense. But there's also a kind of water that offers human soul eternal life. The Israelites were on the move again. And God leads the people. The people complain. And God responds with an amazing graciousness. How far above us is God's grace? Moses has about had it with these people, but God is just getting started loving them through their wilderness. Looking at this scene so many thousands of years later, we know that the sojourn will end, but they didn't. They were weary. They were frightened. They didn't know how long they would be in the wilderness, and I totally get that. I often acknowledge that I can get through anything as long as I know that it will end. But when I can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, I struggle to hold on to my sanity as well as my faith. The Israelites might have felt stuck in the wilderness instead of on their way to the promised land. Their fears and frustrations cause more grumbling, which we understand in our own lives. Yet when grumbling becomes part of our modus operandi, the general way in which we operate, it affects the people around us, and our grumbling affects our whole community. One little grumble can get louder and louder and overtake the wonder of life. God led the Israelites in stages, and they arrived at Rephidim. The problem with Rephidim is that there was no water there. And this people were a growing mass. The grumbling became quarreling, which so often happens. And quarreling could easily lead to distrust and disobedience. And distrust threatens the relationship between God and the people. Distrust threatens any relationship. The people again went to their fallback line. We were better off in Egypt. We hear that almost every week. Egypt wasn't just a place. It had become a state of mind. Bondage, darkness, futility of life. They said in their grumbling that they would rather be in that state than in the state of freedom and dependence on God. The people thought they were in a God-forsaken place and failed to realize in reality it was just the opposite. Moses, then, was commanded to strike the rock on which God stood, and water would pour from it and be a source of life. We don't know exactly where this place is in the Holy Land. What we do know is that the rock of Horeb is not really just a rock. It's a mountain. Horeb has another name, Sinai, a place where the Ten Commandments would be given. And a third name for that place was the Mountain of God. 
The mountain of God or the rock of God is an image that's carried through the Bible. God is my rock and my redeemer. God is the rock of my salvation. Jesus told Simon that he would be Peter, which means rock. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. God is the rock of salvation. Water comes pouring forth, and the lives of the Israelites are saved one more time. Water is life. But no matter how much water a person drinks, she will always have to drink more to survive. Many generations later, Jesus uses this basic fact to offer a different kind of life to all who were willing to receive it. Again, it's the hottest part of the day in the dusty town of Sychar, in the region of Samaria. There had been a long feud between the Jews and the Samaritans. The Jews were very prejudiced against the Samaritans, and the Samaritans were very prejudiced against the Jews. The disciples, the chosen twelve, were not keen on traveling through Samaria. It was dangerous, but Jesus insisted once in Sychar, the disciples went to get food, and Jesus went to Jacob's well, still producing the water all those generations later. A woman came to draw water, strangely, in the heat of the day, which was unusual. Obviously, she did not want to be there with the other women in town. <coughs> At first, she was contemptuous toward Jesus, who was obviously a Jew. Then she was intrigued. Then she was thirsty in a new way. Jesus told her that the water of the well would only quench physical thirst. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But he could offer her something far more important. Those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty again. The woman was definitely interested in this. She dreaded coming to the well every day and making herself vulnerable to others in the village. They looked down on her in disparaging ways. They wouldn't talk to her. They did not want to associate with her. Then Jesus opened her mind and her heart. And the real thirst that was plaguing her could be eased. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. She didn't even know how thirsty her soul was. Moses brought forth God's gracious water to revive the body. <coughs> Jesus brought forth God's gracious water revive the soul. Previously, God had worked through signs and wonders of the natural world. The Israelites found water bursting from the mount. Now God works through signs and wonders of the spiritual world. We are able to claim the living water and allow it to course us. During the season of Lent, it would be good to examine the things for which we really thirst. 
Do we thirst for things that are temporary? Or do we thirst for things that are eternal? Do we want to provide a legacy for our families and friends that will run out? Or do we want to leave a legacy that will quench their thirst forever? I know that people don't much grumble for water in this part of the world. But people do grumble when their life seems narrow, unfulfilled, and less than meaningful. Those who live with God at the center have something to offer these thirsty people. It's not a quick or easy fix, but it will not leave people thirsty over and over again. When we receive the living water, we can offer it to others. We can offer to others a life of spirit and truth. We can offer the living water of our Lord. And we can be a church of the living water.